my students are always asking for more multiple choice questions to practice on, like for the question, can we read more Latin? Should you choose A, definitely, B, assuredly, C, absolutely, or D, indubitably? Well, it might be hard to differentiate between those choices. We're going to work with you today to help you choose the right answer for questions that are a bit more like what you'll see on the AP Latin exam, along with, of course, reviewing the customs of the Gauls in Gallic War Book 6 in Latin and the English reading of Book 7. So I am Ben Johnson, and I teach Latin at Hamden Academy in Hamden, Maine. And I'm joined here with my partner, uh, Jenny Luongo. Jenny? Hey, Ben. I'm Jenny Luongo. I teach Latin at St. Andrew's Episcopal School in Austin, Texas. And as always, it is my honor to be here with Ben Johnson and with you all for AP Latin Review. So as always, our question each day is, quid hodie discamus? What will we learn today? Uh, and today we are going to focus on the chapters of De Bello Gallico book six that we're expected to know in Latin. On yesterday's review, we focused on book six, the English reading, today the Latin reading, in which Caesar explains to his Roman audience his perspective about Gallic customs. Um, we're going to use De Bello Gallico book six to practice those multiple choice questions that Ben was referencing. And we're going to talk about the final book of English reading um, in De Bello Gallico, um, book seven. It's not the, the final book. It's the final book that Caesar wrote. Um, and it's the final book that we're expected to know. Uh, and then next I've week. Got a little, yeah, I've got a little game for you on that, Jenny. So okay. we're going to see how well you can do. On I'm that. excited. I love, I love quizzing you. <laughs> well, and book seven, uh, I think, is my favorite um, of the books, believe it or not. Also the um, longest. It's yeah, very long. that, it's true. It's true. That's not why it's my favorite. But um, uh, so we're wrapping up the De Bello Gallico today and next week we'll be moving into Virgil's Aeneid. So that's also exciting. Uh, I, I hear someone is going to join us today. So oh, it's... good. <gasps> it's a druid. And he says, ex omnibus wobis dignitate ex cello. So he says that um, he um, excels out of all of us. Um, in worthiness, which must mean that he's the um, leader of the Druids, uh, since I, that's what Caesar tells us about them. He thinks a lot about himself, I think. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have him joining us. But today, uh, first, I think we need to know quid occidit, Ben, uh, what happens in book six? Right. So let's talk about the stuff that happens in the Latin that we'll be covering. Um, so we have, uh, what is that, eight chapters of book six from 13 to 20. This is Caesar's description of Gallic customs. And he really kind of splits it into three or four different sections. Um, the first one covers the first three chapters, and that talks about the social structure in Gaul. He very briefly touches upon uh, the plebes, the plebs, the common people, um, and talking about their plight. It's not very good. Um, before going on and spending the bulk of this section talking about the Druids, Druides. Um, this is probably maybe the thing that Caesar finds most interesting. He talks about um, what they do, uh, their authority over most of Gallic society, how you become a Druid, all of that fun stuff. And then he wraps up by talking about the equites, which is the military class um, of the Gauls. Um, these are, uh, you can translate this class as the knights, um, it's similar, at least in the word that Caesar uses, to that um, that rich non-political class in uh, in Rome uh, and in the Roman social structure. Then Caesar goes on and talks about their religious practices, talks about the gods that they worship, um, and uh, how they um, how they deal with their their loot after battle, um, and how they devote that to Mars, and then. Uh, family relationships, um, the role of uh, women, um, how uh, how income is shared and stuff equally, which is pretty neat. Um, but then also about what happens if um, the uh, head of the family, the pater familias, uh, suspiciously dies. Uh, before then finishing up by talking about the power of the state over information um, and how uh, if you hear something that's really important, you really need to tell someone. But not just anyone. 
uh, you know, someone, Im- someone, someone important in a right. position of power. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, you actually, you're not supposed to tell anyone except that person in a position of power. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so let's talk a little bit about the multiple choice section. Um, this is, uh, we've been spending the last three videos prior to this talking about the free response section. And uh, the multiple choice section is actually half of the test. So we're spending one video out of four talking about it when it's 50% of your score. Um, this is uh, 50 questions. So you can imagine that each question is 1% of the possible points on the AP exam. And uh, you have one hour to complete the multiple choice section. And it's really passage-based. It's governed by the four different passages. One of those passages is going to be from the Virgil syllabus, something that if you've covered all of the readings from the Aeneid um, that are on the AP curriculum, then you will have seen this passage before. This is something that's really important. And this is, this is why you should really have a good familiarity with the parts of the Aeneid that are on the syllabus. If you are planning on studying and preparing for this test, um, going through the Latin readings will make this section um, and the, all the other parts, especially the three response section, um, so much easier for you because you'll recognize the passage and you'll know a little bit more about everything um, when it comes to the questions. You'll also have a passage from the Caesar syllabus. Um, these passages, Jenny, can be like thinking of the Aeneid section, like 10 to 15 lines about yeah, they're they're a little longer than like the translation or the short answer um, selection. Um, maybe about the size of the essay selection. Yeah, that's a good that's a good reference point, I think. And we've talked about like that, and we've seen an example of uh, of the passages on the essay uh, in um, in the previous video. So um, go look at that. Um, the passages actually that we're going to practice on because of limitations of screen size and stuff today. Um, are going to be a little bit shorter than what you would see on um, on an AP Latin exam. And then so after you do those two passages, and that's about 50% of the um, of the questions that you'll see, you'll also have two other passages. Um, one is poetry that is a sight reading passage. So you should not, you probably, unless you've read a large amount of Latin literature, you probably haven't seen this before. And uh, the other one is a um, a sight reading that's prose, so not poetry. Um, sometimes my students ask me what prose is, and it's easier to define prose by saying that it's not poetry. Caesar is prose, Virgil uh, is poetry. So it's 50% of the exam, and there will be glosses. So those are defined words, and we've talked about those with the translation, um, but those glosses are really only going to be on the sight passages. But hopefully they'll be enough, and those glosses are really targeted to um, helping you answer certain questions and help you understand uh, the passage as you're reading through. So it's not just random words that maybe you don't know, um, but important words that you likely don't know. Um, and if you're, um, if you are worried that there's a word on there that you don't know, you, you maybe you can get by without knowing what that word is and still understand uh, what's going on in that passage. All right, so let's talk about some tips for successfully completing the multiple choice. Um, ben mentioned that this section of the exam is about an hour. So even though it's 50% of your score, it's a third of the time you're gonna spend. Um, and so I think this section is the one where you're really going to want to manage your time um, so that you can answer every question because there's no penalty for um, making a guess on a question. Um, and so there's really no reason not to answer every single question um, unless you um, run out of time. But even if you're running out of time, better to guess Answer, than to leave right. it blank. Just fill Answer in bubbles. Everything. At that point. Yeah, fill in bubbles. We we support finishing every question. Um, so um, the first two passages um, should be the passages that are based on the syllabus. Um, and so you can start with with whichever passage you feel the most comfortable about, just so you stay on track with your bubbling. And you make sure that your um, answer sheet bubble line up with the correct number. Um, if you're worried about that, then just do them in order. Um, each passage is going to have an English 
title, or at least each site passage is going to have an English title. So um, use those things to um, situate yourself. And actually, um, Ben, the um, syllabus-based passages also have an English title, correct, on the multiple choice? Yes, but there's no citation. Like, it won't tell you the book and the line numbers that it's from. Right. But it will, but it will say something like um, Aeneas, uh, well, now we should do a Caesar one. Um, the uh, Caesar arrives at Cicero's camp or something like that. Something like that. So it's going to have an English title. Use that to orient yourself, to situate yourself. Um you know, as you're working through, you may want to start by just kind of glancing over the passage and kind of seeing if you remember the context. But certainly for each question, you want to look back at the passage. We're going to be talking about the different types of questions, but most every question is going to be asking you about the word or words in the context of the passage. So you always want to make sure you're looking back and there'll be line numbers and that sort of thing to help guide you with that. Um, if you have to guess, then use good multiple choice strategy. Eliminate one or more of the options that seems absolutely incorrect before you make your guess. Um, the glosses are specifically targeted to help you with certain questions. Um, so don't forget to use those glosses because they are, they are there to help you with certain questions. Um, Answering the questions in order can be a really big help to guiding you through the passage. Um, they are set up to help do that, so use them. Um, and then as you are thinking about each question, use the punctuation and also the line divisions in poetry to help you focus on, in on exactly which part of the passage you're being asked about and to use it to help you understand what's going on, to make it more understandable to you. So, so what do you mean when you say use punctuation? Um, so for instance, um, obviously um, a period or a semicolon is a hard stop. So that's putting a definite separation in for you. Um, in terms of the other punctuation like commas, I tell my students to, um, you know, if they're trying to determine where a clause ends, then, um, look for a comma that happens maybe right after a verb to help them divide it into different clauses. Sometimes commas are just going to be separating items in a list. So make sure you're thinking about that. Sometimes commas might be separating out an ablative absolute or evocative noun that's being addressed like Brute at two or Heus Ben, aren't you having fun at this multiple choice review? Um, <laughs> I, I have not. <laughs> no. <laughs> we need to get to some actual multiple choice before I can have fun. Yeah, yeah. When we're looking at Latin, it's much more fun than this, obviously. Skila cat, as I something, say to my students. Yeah, something I know that I know that uh, Latin has this um this uh this nasty rumor that it just throws words down in random order and stuff. And and sometimes like you'll be asked to um, identify the noun that an adjective is describing. Use punctuation there. Like it's probably not if there's a comma um, between one of the options and the adjective, that's probably not that one because Latin actually doesn't have random word order. Um, it's just a little bit different than what we're used to. And the more you read Latin, the more familiar you are with the word order and the more you actually appreciate it. Uh, and you can handle it and you can deal with it. And you see the reason why words are put in a certain place, so. But Semper, I could not agree with you more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I tell my kids all the time, um, Latin word order isn't random. Things are happening for a reason. So read them in order and think about what you're seeing and what you're expecting. Um, and commas and periods help you with that. Yeah, and, and, and it's never just words are down there in order to fit in the meter, which is always something that, why is this adjective at the end of the line? That's my, often I hear, well, it's because that's the only place it could be because of the meter. No. Actually, no, there's, there's, there's more reasons than that. There is. That's, that's a place of emphasis. So let's so, practice. Yeah, let's talk about types of multiple choice questions. And we have adapted some Caesar sentences um, to talk about um, our families and some other things here. So hopefully this will be interesting and exciting for you all. Um, so, est mea familia. Um, so we've got a sentence de mea familia about my family, omnes in disciplina versantur, ut 
out discipuli, out magistri. Um, and so after you have that sentence from the passage, normally it would be a, a longer passage you're looking at, there's a question about vocabulary in line one where santor means what? A lot of times the words that are targeted for these vocabulary questions are words that have more than one meaning. And so they're asking you to look at the context to help determine the meaning. So here we've got several different options. A, all omnes are worshiped in learning. Maybe not. B, all where santur are engaged in learning. C, all where santur are situated in learning or D, all are thought in learning. Um, so I think the thing that makes most sense in terms of where santur and also is one of the meanings of where sore is B, are engaged. So um, let's see if I'm right. Oh my goodness, the druid agrees with me. Well, he's um, very he, confident. I was going to say, too. even though um, he um, he excels uh, beyond me, but you know that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's all of that, all of that stuff that he has in his head that he's memorized too. Uh, yeah. yeah, Intelligo, Intelligo. Okay. This, this question kind of looks like it's a translation question, but it's not a translation question, right? And that's something to keep in mind. Things that that look like they're asking you to translate, actually, the, all of those choices are are passive. Um, and our third person plural. So um, it's actually, it's all about the meaning of that word. Yeah, absolutely. So another type of question you'll encounter are grammar questions. So here we've adapted a little bit of Caesar. Ego et meus vir pecuniam communicamus. Uh, my husband and I, we share our money. Ratio pecuniae omnis, the accounting of um, all the money, conjunctum habetor is held jointly. And now we get to the sentence that has the question about it. The case and use of fructus in line three is what we're going for. Nostri liberi tamen, omnes fructus capiunt, said eos amamus. So I see there the, the nostri liberi, which looks like a nominative plural for that verb capiunt. So I think um, nominatives are probably not options for omnes and fructus. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eliminate um, A and C based on the nostri liberi. Um, and so um, our children, um, omnes fructus, um, Omnes can't be a genitive. So I'm going to eliminate the genitive singular. And now I'm going to check that accusative plural option. Our children, they take all our profits. Well, that seems totally reasonable to me. Um, so let's see what the druid says. Uh, D, accusative yes. plural. I was right. So fructus is a fourth declension noun. So this is a very, very common question that is easily asked about fourth declension nouns. Yes, because that US could be so many different things. Four. In fact, four common yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my turn, my family. So here we go. So we got liberi mei, um, the S filios meos here. But liberi mei net flicem at Disney plurem. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, a good one. Spec, yeah, spectare amant, sed cum scelerati sunt eo spectaculis interdico. Hmm, haec poina est gravissima. Apud eos. So um, the question here that, so this is a reading comp, but I didn't translate it because I didn't want to actually tell you everything that's going on here because you really should um, try to use your understanding of the Latin to help you through um, these reading comprehension questions. So it's just going to ask you to summarize what's going on in a certain line. And so what happens when the children are wicked? Um, and that's uh, really focusing in on sed cum scelerati sunt, but when they are wicked. Um, and so we have options over here on the right-hand side. So their parents yell at them. They must watch Disney Plus. That's quite a punishment. Uh, they are forbidden from their shows and they say bad things. So I'm really going to be looking at um, uh, the clause that's associated with um, this cum scelerati sunt, and that's this eo spectaculis interdico. Um, maybe you don't know what interdico means, but you know that spectaculis is like a show um, because of a spectacle. I can even use um, uh, an English derivative to help me with that. So um, as the person who does the uh, forbidding, I'm going to go with C here uh, and say that that they're forbidden. And the Druid says that I'm entirely in my right to do this. 
to the children when they are wicked. Um, I don't think that's a very popular choice though, looking at this picture. Um, there are also reference questions. And so this is going to be um, a pronoun usually uh, that is, um, you're asking for what does the pronoun refer to? Uh, to whom does eos in line three refer? And so this, uh, this eos, who's the them is really the question here. So is it Liberi, line one? Is it Netflixem at Disney Plurem, line one? Is it Spectaculis, line three? Or is it the Poina in line three? And this punishment is the uh, most serious among them in that them, the people that are most impacted by this are the Liberi, my children, and our Druid agrees with me. Now we can have translation. So I mentioned this before with, uh, with that vocabulary question. It looks like it could be translation but it isn't because the grammar is not really being tested there. Here, grammar is being tested and sometimes vocabulary is, but oftentimes it isn't. Um, so what's the best translation for grauissima in line three? And um, we have serious, more serious, too serious or most serious. So I think from this word, this adjective, and also from the options, you can kind of see that um, we're trying to test whether you know how to translate a superlative. And so that is going to be D, most serious. And yes, the Druid does say that this punishment is the most serious. Okay, so now uh, we have literary devices. These are figures of speech that um, will be asked on the multiple choice question. Um, and make sure that there's a list of figures of speech, around 20 or so, um, that you should know. And those 20 are going to be the options here. Um, that you'll see on the multiple choice section. So let's look at uh, my other children, my two cats. Uh, so said cum scout et bella in bello where santur et bellum in amicas interfeles illatum est, uh, bella in iurias multas infert, uh, est bellum contra bellum. You like that, Jenny? That's a nice yeah, level. that's a great one. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, Parwai feles quoque in Bello, where Santor. So this is talking about Scout and Bella, our, my two cats, Scout's on the left here, Bella is on the right. Uh, they're also engaged in war. And uh, they, uh, this war um, is brought on among the cats, um, among these enemicas, these enemy cats. And uh, Bella, um, when this happens, Bella um, brings on uh, many injuries. So. Line two, this bellum in amicas interfeles illatum est. Make sure that you pay attention to the line reference and also the uh, the words that are mentioned here. So bellum to illatum est. Um, what figure of speech is this? And I think if you look at the adjectives and the nouns that go with them, you'll see that um, this isn't really a litotes, like a, a, an understatement or a double negative. It's not really metonymy here because we're not using one word to refer to another. Um, and then a syndeton is a lack of conjunctions when you should expect one here, but that's that's not going on here. But you can see that bellum and allatum um, are, uh, I guess, go together and in amicas and phele. So this is a chiasmus. And there we go. He agrees. <laughs> Uh, and so then we can also have a grammar question. Um, what is the subject of where Santor in line three, four? And we have uh, in Yorias, Bellam, Feles, or Bello. So um, it's a very straightforward one. Which one is nominative? And you can see in the sentence, it's kind of a comprehension question where you can see that Feles are engaged in war. Um, but uh, I think Feles is really the only one there that can be nominative. So um, let's go with Feles and our druid knows Latin. So he's good He's good figuring out his uh, subjects of verbs. Yeah, he's clearly well-educated as druids are. Yeah. Um, so um, the last kind of question that you might see on a prose passage multiple choice is um, one that references culture or the English reading, kind of like we had those on the short answer section. Um, so here we're being asked what God is described in this passage. So we'll just read through it really fast. Est alius filius jovis et nuntius deorum, est in ventor omnium artium et dux viarum atque itenerum, vim maximum ad quaestus pecuniae mercatura 
Pasque Habet. So um, I see that um, he is another son of Jupiter. So A, Jupiter, I'm going to eliminate. And the Nuntius, the messenger deorum of the gods. So I, I know that's Mercury. I'm pretty sure that's Mercury, but I'm just going to read through to verify. Um, so he's the originator of all skills, a leader of the roads and ways. Uh, and he has the greatest power over um, acquisitions of money and mercantile things. I know Mercury is associated with merchants, hence the name Mercury. So I'm going to say B. Let's see what the Druid says. Oh, excellent. He would know too. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. He's in charge of religiones. So this is sphere. Yeah. Um, so I think um, now we're going to spectamus some exempla, right? We're going to look at some more examples. Some actual Caesar. Yeah, right? some actual Caesar. Um, so, of course, the first thing you want to do, I bet the Druid has some advice for them, Ben. Does he have anything to say here? Uh, I, I hear something. I hear okay. something. I think he's, I, th I think he went to get a coffee, but he's you know, coming back he now. He can't he's, do that. He can't do he that. He can't. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> he has a job to do. So yeah, exactly. Here he is. Here he is. Okay. So he says, Legamus, let's read. Always good advice. Um, so um, in line three, Habeter is translated. Again, it looks like a translation question, but here it, it's, it's both understanding the word in context and translating it appropriately. So for the plebis, the common people um, is held, are held. Um, so um, let's see, we've got A is considered, B has, C has or ha has had, and D will be held. Um, so here, this is also a tense question, right? So the common people is held almost in the place loco of enslaved persons. So I think the best way to translate that is A considered. Let's see what we've got. Oh, yes. yay. There we go. Yeah. All right. Moving so right along. Highlight, highlight the right answer in blue. Yeah, perfect. So here we've got another figure of speech question. Sometimes we forget that literary devices can be used in prose too. Um, so non plebes pine servorum habetor loco quae nihil audet per se nullo adhibetor concilio. Um, so I'm just looking through this, and, and tamesis is when you split a Latin word with a, another word in it, or English. Um, I don't see anything split in that passage. Um, apostrophe is when you address um, a god or something inanimate that can't respond. I don't see that. A syndeton. I have a I have a good feeling about that because it's the common people who audet, who dare nothing um, through themselves. Um, is held by no plan. It seems like there could be an and there. So I think a syndeton, let's check for a transferred epithet. I don't see an adjective referring to something unexpected. So I'm going to say C. Yeah. Okay. Moving right along to our next question. Um, now we're doing that per se. And I know that if it's a form of sui sibi se se or an adjective like sua sa um, it's going to be going back to the main subject of the sentence. So in line four, say refers to, I'm going to say be plebes, that subject of the sentence. As I like to say, say is the same as the subject. Yeah. Alliteration. In. It, that is great. That is yeah. great. All right. Let's just continue on to my next question. So now we've got a reading comprehension. Plerique cum aut aere alieno, aut magnitudine tributorum, aut inuria potentiorum premuntor sese in servitutem decant nobilibus. And our question is, according to those lines five through eight, plerique through nobilibus, the common people are oppressed by. So are oppressed, I see premuntor. They are oppressed, they're oppressed. And I see they're oppressed out ire alieno, either by debt, out magnitude ne tributorum, or by the great size of taxes, or by inuria, the injustice potentiorum of more powerful people. So A, prison doesn't work, B, general suspicion doesn't work, but C, high taxation does, and D, community service doesn't. So let's say C. Yeah, I liked how you you actually said taxation, but you went through the whole passage just to make sure because sometimes you don't want to maybe misunderstand a word and then see that in the options and automatically go there. Right. Um, sometimes when you see a decent answer, like just take a second and look to see if there's a better one. Agreed. Agreed. All right. So um, now we're looking at the next 
part after the colon of this sentence in hos eadem omnia sunt jura. So in lines eight through nine, eadem omnia sunt jura is translated. So um, I would say, because I kind of take that dominis as a clue that there's like a date of a possession, I'd say like they have all the same laws or maybe all the laws are the same if I'm not worried about that date of a possession. So let's see which of my options make sense with that. Um, so I don't think A is going to work, although it's close, but B, all laws the same as, are the same as better because it's plural and we're doing a translation. Um, rivers isn't it. These omens aren't it. So I'm going to say B. All right. Okay. In line 11, the case and number of Druidum are. So I see, see that UM and I immediately think, could I possibly have a genitive plural? They really like to ask about those. And so I see alterum est druidum, alterum equitum. So one is of the druids, one is of the equites. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with that genitive plural answer. I think I'm right there. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, there's there's that alterum right in between two genitive plurals. That's that can be tricky. It's, it tricky, is tricky. tricky. Yeah. It is tricky because you know you want to say accusative when you see a um, but I've I've kind of learned if, if they ask about a um, I better think could it be genitive plural? It could be accusative singular, right? That's or mm -hmm. nominative singular. Like don't automatically go to genitive plural, but start with genitive plural, I think. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good it's a good bet that that could be what they're asking about. Although it could be an accusative direct object. Okay. And now we've got our culture question. What was the title of the chief priest in Roman culture? Since we're talking about priests. Um, and so A, Rex Sacrorum, B, Flamendialis, C, Sacerdos, or D, Pontifex Maximus. I know that Pontifex Maximus is the title of the chief priest in Roman culture. So I think it's that. Yep. Yeah. Nice job. Well done. So here is a... Uh, another reading and uh, I think our our druid is probably coming back I hear him coming back from getting his coffee he had a nice little break of giving answers so and he says wobis legendum est you must read it so let's just give this a quick little uh quick little scan just to see like just to get our context for this passage we're talking about the Gallic can calendar the Gauls doing something there I see dies in the first line um, dies natales. Okay, that's going to help us understand this passage as we go through. You don't want to spend too much time, but some time is good. Uh, and we also have some glosses down at the bottom. So think about that and how those could be used um, as you're trying to help understand this passage. Just quickly look. Dies is Dies, the god of the underworld. Pridico, proclaim boast. Proto is to relate or report or hand down. Infinio is to determine or define. So the first question uh, looks like it's a reading comprehension question. With the phrase ob eum causam in line three, Caesar alludes to the fact that D, A, dwells in darkness, B, is proverbially wealthy, C, favors the Gauls in battle, D, speaks only to Druids. Um, so the phrase itself doesn't really tell me anything. It says because of this reason. So let's go to the previous sentence here and how the Gauls say that they... Uh, are all descended from Dees. And this has been passed down by the Druids. Um, so uh, let's say that he alludes because of this reason, uh, actually I'm not seeing the answer there. So let's move forward. They define Fineunt, the space of all time, uh, not by the number of days, but by the number of nights. And so I think, okay, so we're talking about nights here, uh, the the evening, not not the the social class. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna allude, go with A here because he dwells in darkness. That's the reason why they deal with night rather than day. Whew, good. I I was a little a uh, little drawn off track on that one, but I I was able to use my understanding. I looked at all those options and I didn't see something that uh, made sense to me, and so I continued pressing and finally got to that right answer. So. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy about that. Good okay, resilience. So number, yeah, resi <laughs> grit. Grit is sometimes grit. really good yes. in, in these tests. Uh, what was the first day of each month in the Roman calendar called? This looks like it's a culture question, right, Jenny? Yeah. Um, so it's not really in the passage here. I just have to rely on what my Latin teacher maybe talked to me about, talked to us about in class or what we read um, in some readings and stuff. And or maybe a video on YouTube that I saw about this. 
Um, and so I'm just going to go with the uh, the calendar. That's the first day, the calends. And that's actually where we get the word calendar from. Uh, OK, so number three, as used in line four, numero is. OK, so there it is in line four. Uh, an ablative of comparison, an ablative of means, a dative of agent, or a dative of possession. So for this, I'm going to use my understanding of the passage. And I'm going to try all of these out. Um, so they they determine or define um, the span of all their time, not, okay, so if it's comparison, I would translate as not than the number of days. That doesn't make sense. Um, ablative of means not, I use by or with for ablative of means, so not by the number of days. That makes sense to me. Um, let's just keep going on. So data of agent would also be by, but like that's used with a gerundive of obligation for the most part. So I'm going to rule that one out. And uh, and then dative of possession, um, like the number is not possessing anything. And there's no S and stuff. So I'm going to go with B, ablative of means. And there it is. Yes, it is yeah. ablative of means. OK. Uh, who reformed the Roman calendar in 45 BC? So this is, uh, this is a history question. It's kind of a culture question, but kind of a background. Um, I know because he's one of the guys that we read about. And this is, and that, that date 45 BC just kind of comes out to me as being a really important date when Caesar was in charge of all of Rome. So this is uh, B, Julius Caesar. He did reform the calendar and he created the Julian calendar, which for the most part we use today with just some slight revisions. Okay, question five, what official was responsible for regulating the Roman calendar? So again, another culture question. This, this is a pretty heavy on culture questions. Uh, is it the censor, an edile, the Pontifex Maximus, or a quaestor? Um, pretty sure that the calendar has some religious significance here. Um, and the person here that deals with religion, as, as Jenny pointed out, right, the, the head of Roman religion is C, the Pontifex Maximus. Um, so there we go. Okay, good, back to some grammar questions. I can actually use the passage here. So the case and number of say in line one are. Okay, so this is one of those that, you know, it, it can be asked because it's an ambiguous form. Accusative singular, ablative singular, accusative plural or ablative plural. So let's go to the passage and let's use my understanding of the passage to help me figure out this case and number. Uh, okay, so the Gauls, proclaim or boast that they are all descended from. OK, so it looks like it's the subject of an indirect statement here. Uh, and the subject of an indirect statement is accusative. Uh, but I've got two accusative options. Um, so say is the same as the subject. And praedicant is plural. And golly, the Gauls, is also plural. So I'm going to go with C, accusative plural. And yes, that's right, good. Okay, the verb subsequatur in line seven is subjunctive because it occurs in. Okay, so this is a, uh, a grammar question. Um, it's asking about uh, which clause it's subjunctive. So I see that ut prior to that, ut noctem die subsequatur, which means indirect command, purpose clause, result clause, fearing clause. Uh, I'm going to rule out C, a relative clause of characteristic, though, because that's introduced by a relative clause. And I don't see a qui, quad, quad here. Um, so let's look at this sentence here. So they observe their birthdays and the beginnings of months and of years seek in such a way that day follows night. So it's like it's like the result of their observation is that day follows night. And that seek is one of those intensifying words that really kind of shows that there's a result clause coming. So this is A, a result clause. And there we go. There's one, hopefully this is the last one. Uh, which word in this passage can be translated as the beginnings? So it's kind of like a, a vocabulary question here. Temporis, time, mensum, months, anorum, years, initia, initials kind of is an English word that I come from. So it comes from that. So I'm going to go with D because that initia seems like the beginnings is better fit for that, even if that's not a word that I, that I really know. And there we go. Okay, Jenny, exerceamus, let's practice. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, on this section, um, we really do want you to pause the video, think it through. We're going to give you the answers at the very end. Um, but I'm just going to be reading through the questions and relying on you to pause, write your answers down just for the sake of time. So we're doing this section about controlling information. Number one, in line two, exist a monitor is translated A, exist, B, value, C, our thought, D, have existed. And now's the time to pause. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, he, he our did come druid. back and say he wants us to read. Yeah. He does want us to read this. So I got a little ahead of ourselves, but you've got the you've got the question. So um, hopefully you've got your answer down, and we can move on to the next one. All right, number two, the case and use of legibus in line three are a dative of purpose, b dative of indirect object, c ablative of means, d ablative of specification. You can pause now, and we'll move to the next one. In number three, in line three, C quiz is translated A, if who, B, if anyone, C, unless anything, D, unless which. And now it's time to pause and think. Okay. Number four, what is the tense and mood of a caperate in line five? A, present indicative, B, future perfect indicative, C, present subjunctive, D, perfect subjunctive. We'll pause and move on. Number five, according to Caesar, what does the law require Gallic persons to do when they hear a rumor about the state? A, they must report to their neighbors. B, they should tell it to government officials. C, they can never speak about it, of it, sorry, speak of it. And D, they should share it when they feel more comfortable. We'll let you pause and then we'll move on. Number six, what is the use of the infinitive terreri in line eight? Is it A, historical infinitive, B, indirect statement, C, complementary infinitive, or D, subject infinitive? Time to pause. And number seven, when Yarbus hears a rumor in book four of the Aeneid, his prayers force Jupiter to speak immediately to what other deity? Is it A, Mercury, B, Neptune, C, Juno, or D, Venus? So that's our last question on this passage. Be sure you pause, finish up your answers, and we'll move on to the answers. Okay, you ready? Yes. Okay. So here we go. So in line two, Existimantor is translated as C, our thought. The case and use of legibus in line three are an ablative of means. In line three, sequis is translated if anyone. This is that after si, nisi, nomen, ne. Ali takes a holiday. In number four, what is the tense and mood of a caperit? In line five, that's perfect subjunctive. Five, according to Caesar, what does the law require Gallic persons to do when they hear a rumor about the state? B, they should tell it to government officials. We talked about that at the top of this video. Six, what is the use of the infinitive terreri in line eight? It's B, an indirect statement. And seven, when Yarbus hears a rumor in book four of the Aeneid, his prayers force Jupiter to speak immediately to which other deity? And that's an English reading question um, about the other work, but it relates here because of rumor. So that's A, Mercury. Okay, you ready for your book seven review? I am. I am. So um, book seven, as I said, is one of my favorites. Um, at the beginning, we learned that there is some political unrest in Rome. This is the year 52 BC and Clodius, a populist politician, has died in um, a, a skirmish, some sort of battle on the Appian Way. Um, Rome is um, in a bit of an uproar. As a matter of fact, the mob takes Clodius's body and burns the Senate house down, which is why Julius Caesar, in the end, when he was assassinated, was not assassinated in the Senate house because it had been burned to the ground in this year 52. So this prompts Vercingetorix to unite all Gaul and lead a resistance against the Romans. Um, as a matter of fact, um, one um, group takes um, control of the city Canabum and actually kills all Roman citizens. They are kind of instigating this revolt. So after a series of battles, including one in which Caesar lost, the Gauls um, 
make their final stand at a place called Elysia, a fortress they believed was impregnable. But Caesar not only builds a wall around to lay siege to Elysia, he builds a second wall, we call it a double circumvallation, um, to protect his troops um, who are there laying siege to Elysia so that no Gallic reinforcements can get to them. In the end, Vercingetorix is captured and the Gallic resistance ends, although um, in book eight, there is, is kind of an attempt at a, another last stand and Caesar deals with it very harshly. Okay, so we are going to test your knowledge of this, your favorite book, with something called uh, Duo Facta et Unum Infectum, reference to the Aeneid here. You know what that means, right? Yeah, two, two facts or two truths and one untruth, one lie. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to give you three things. I want you to tell me which one's the lie. Okay, so let's 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 try it out a little bit. This is a personal video for us. So uh, let's talk a little bit about me. First one, my favorite historian is Ammianus Marcellinus. My childhood cat was a tabby named Dromeo, and I've never broken a bone. Which one's the lie? So I didn't know you as a child, and so I'm not actually totally sure about this, but I do remember one time we were talking about Ammianus Marcellinus, and um, you made a statement that made me think that he's not your favorite. So I'm going to say that's the lie. Uh, very good. Yeah, I don't, his Latin's not very good. So <laughs> I don't think he was good at Latin. <laughs> let's put it that way. Maybe he didn't understand it. Uh, okay, so he, let's get to the real stuff. Let's see if you can get all of these. Um, two truths and a lie, find the lie. Caesar commands 13 legions in Gaul in book seven. Book seven begins with a revolt among the Carnutes and the Gauls are afraid that the Romans will destroy Druidism. Which one is not true? So um, the Carnutes are the ones who um, end up um, killing the Roman citizens in Canabum. So I think that's true. I certainly think the Gauls must've been afraid that the Romans would have destroyed Druidism. So I'm gonna say that 13 legions in Gaul. Yes, that's right. Um, I should probably know how many legions he had. I think he probably had like seven. Okay. Ten. Something I, like that. 13, 13 is a lot. 13 is yeah. a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about this one? Vercingetorix's father was killed for trying to unite and control all of Gaul. Vercingetorix is a chief of the Aedui. Vercingetorix is declared king at Gergovia, which one so my, is the lie? My eyes were tricking me at first and I kind of panicked. Uh, but then when I heard you say Aedui, uh, Vercingetorix is from the Arwerni. So that I believe is the lie. Oh, very good. Very good. Yeah. It's the A Gauls, right? That's, that's why yeah. I was trying to trick you here. You almost did. Okay. So the Romans defeat Vercingetorix at Avaricum. Uh, the Aedui revolt against the Romans and betray Caesar. And the Romans defeat Vercingetorix at Gergovia. So Gergovia is one of Caesar's two military losses in, in his lifetime. So I'm going to go with that's the lie. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. Um, so about 80,000 Gallic soldiers retreat to Elysia. The Romans build walls 25 miles in length around Elysia and the Gallic relief force of 250,000 soldiers never arrives. Which one is the lie? I think it's the lack of arrival of the relief force, but I'm not positive about this one. Let's try that. The lack of the lack of, yes, the lie is that the lack I don't know. This is like a Latotis, right? Yeah. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was they, they a do lot arrive. Of they do arrive. Yeah. And there is a there is a, a fierce battle. Okay, this is the last one. You're you're batting a hundred, a thousand right now. So Vercingetorix surrenders to the Romans. Caesar goes on to write book eight of the Gallic War. Caesar is granted 20 days of thanksgiving for his victory over the Gauls. So I know Aulus Hirtius, his lieutenant, wrote book eight. So I'm gonna say that's the lie. In factum est. Yes, that is the lie. Okay, so quid nunc sciamus, what should we know now? So we've talked about the customs of the Gauls, uh, Gallic War, book six, 13 through 20 in Latin. And uh, Jenny did a fantastic job covering book seven in English and figuring out the lies and everything that I was trying to trick her with. So then we looked at the different types of multiple choice questions. Jenny, you think the Druid's gonna say goodbye? Uh, seek Sparrow, I hope so. Oh, he says habeo, I have. Sumam auctoritatem, the um, highest authority in terra vos omnes um, among you all, which is certainly true. Is certainly could, true. I could ask you a multiple choice question. What noun does sumam modify? Auctoritatem. 
I'm sure about that one. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's correct. All right. So don't forget tinyurl.com slash AP Latin 2022 review. We've got materials there for you. Um, If you want more review, if you want more multiple choice practice, um, it's all there. Multas gratias. We're so glad you joined us today. We will say um, walete until next week. When we cover the Aeneid, right? Yeah, I'm excited. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.